Are we good? All right. Let's talk about short films. In the world of cinema, short films are very overlooked, and it doesn't take long to find out why. Not only is it huge for screenwriters and directors due to the amount of creative freedom they are given, even if it's their first time writing or directing anything, the big downside with it is it's very hard to market. And while I do respect a well-done short film if it has a certain atmosphere the filmmaker was intending and was successful at aiming for, I get a different feeling when the short is animated. And there is no better example than the number of anime shorts and anime anthology films that have been released over the last 35 years, from Neo Tokyo, to Memories, from Katsuhiro Otomo, to Animatrix, to Genius Party, to Anakuti 15, and the treasure trove of Hayao Miyazaki shorts you can only see at the Ghibli Museum. Maybe it's because I've gotten familiar with these directors over the years, but there is something memorable about watching these great minds come up with these incredible stories with little to no creative limitations, and especially with the anime, for the most part, they seem to get better with age. Something I'm pretty confident will happen with the topic of today's video. An anthology film created by Studio Ponic, a studio founded by Oscar-nominated director Hiromasa Yonobayashi, and Oscar-nominated producer Yoshiaki Nishimura, who helm a staff made up of former employees from Studio Ghibli's film division before it closed down after the release of their latest film when Marnie was there in 2014. According to Nishimura in an interview by the late Zach Bertschi for Anime News Network, after the studio finished Mary and the Witch's Flower, the studio, as a whole, was pretty burnt out because of how much work it took hand-drawing a feature-length film over a span of a couple years. And after looking at the world of film in an objective view, it was decided the studio would make short films. Initially, the studio was going to make a 30-minute Mary and the Witch's Flower spinoff before it was changed to four shorts totaling in a half hour, which is approximately seven and a half minutes per short, before the runtime was later extended per short for the final product, something that was a challenge for the studio creatively, while also, at the same time, making something different. The reason why there are three shorts instead of the originally planned four shorts is because the fourth one was supposed to be directed by Isao Takahata in his first project since the tale of the Princess Kaguya in 2013, but unfortunately he passed away a month after pre-production started and after the film was announced in April of 2018. The three shorts, which add up to 53 minutes, was released in Japan on August 24th, 2018, in a very rare case of solid marketing due to where the shorts came from. Two months later, G-Kids acquired the North American rights and showed it in theaters for two days, with the subtitled version premiering on January 10th of 2019, and the new English dub two days later on January 12th in 370 theaters, racking up over $178,000 before being put on Netflix in September of that year. Given the title of the film, these shorts showcase three different acts of care and heroism made by ordinary people, even in the most unique of circumstances, which will be specified as I go through each short in this video. My name is Payne, and this is Ponic Short Films Theater, Volume 1, Modest Heroes. Crap. Kanini and Kanino is an 18-minute short written and directed by Yonobayashi and scored by Yonobayashi regular Takatsugu Muramatsu. The short follows a pair of tiny freshwater crab siblings named, to no one's surprise, Kanini and Kanino, who embark through a dangerous journey to find their father after they were caught in a stream while their mother was away having more kids, because I guess that's what crabs do. Yonomayashi was supposedly inspired to write this story after the birth of his second son in late 2017 and was written based on his feelings about keeping his family safe and his first kid's fears of being forgotten. The mix of 2D and CG animation had its moments, ranging from breathtaking to very uncanny. The music was alright, nothing to really rave about, but it does show how in sync both y Yonomayashi and Muramatsu are after working with each other so much up to this point. And the screenplay is the best part of the short for me. Even though there is barely any dialogue in the short, and when there is, it's what the seiyu for Kanidi described as crab language, Yonobayashi took advantage of it and added shots and moments which indicate both their place in the food chain and the emotions the characters express, especially to the title characters before they decide to find their father. But unfortunately, the decision to ba have barely any dialogue is also a double-edged sword, 
as it doesn't pair well with its relatively short runtime. It felt like it would have worked if it was probably 5 or 10 minutes longer, then we would have seen like a stronger overall dynamic between the characters. But even though there wasn't enough depth in the story, the animation for the most part did make up for it. And I'd suggest if you haven't seen Modest Heroes already, uh, to give the first short a quick watch for yourself. <laughs> The next short is titled Life Ain't Gonna Lose, also known as Samurai Egg. This is the directorial and written debut of Yoshiyuki Momose, who worked for Ghibli as an animator as far back as Grave of the Fireflies in 1988. It's been marketed as a quote-unquote human drama and is based on a true story about a kid named Shun who has a deadly egg allergy that could be really serious when he comes in any form of contact with it. And it's also about his mother, who attempts to take care of him and make sure he doesn't have a reaction, while also maintaining her job as a dance instructor. The characters in animation are the best parts of this short, as the storybook type art style and fluid animation give off a nostalgic feel, something along the lines of the tale of the Princess Kaguya with its aesthetic. There's a moment towards the end of the short where Shun gets an allergic reaction and runs down the stairs in their apartment, and it's my favorite scene in the entire short. The animation goes well with the given tone of the story is trying to convey, and giving a better idea of just how close to death Shun really is in this situation. While this isn't the best short out of the three, this is the one which hits me the most emotionally. As someone who's been on a certain food plan since even before elementary school, it was pretty easy to overlook how much work my family has done to teach me about what's good and not good for my body. Albeit, it's nowhere near as bad as this, but it's still in the same ballpark. Overall, Life Ain't Gonna Lose is pretty great, as it gives us a look at just how important the people who keep us safe really mean to us. An invisible man sleeping in your bed. The final short, and my favorite out of the three, is Invisible, the directorial and written debut by former Ghibli character designer Akihiko Yamashita, whose career goes back to 1987 but made his first credit with Ghibli on Howl's Moving Castle. The story follows a man who seems to be invisible, whether that is actually invisible or metaphorically invisible, it works either way. This pulls off what Kanini and Kanino does, only instead of playing as a disadvantage to the character, it's frankly the exact opposite. The fact this guy barely talks plays well to what he thinks his place in the world is, which, compared to the previous shorts, is a more general emotion of feeling like no one notices you. Like, you might have a place in this world, but no one wants to give you that chance. It's even got so bad, in one scene he starts to lose his sense of gravity, which now symbolizes he may not have a place in this world at all, let alone people are not noticing you. The color palette separates this short from the others as it's all dreary and depressing, the design of the Invisible Man makes you very sympathetic for him, and the action-packed moments scattered throughout the short makes this all the more entertaining. Overall, the main outlook I got from these three shorts shows, in the grander scheme of things, how much Studio Ponic as a whole wants to progress and evolve in the future, uh, both in just working on things in general and creatively as a studio given this is volume one implies there may be more regardless if they make one or not i'm excited as to see what they will create or adapt next they are definitely going to be on my radar for the years to come